do what to this? I mean, your your students already did an amazing job on this. I mean, they did. On. No, they did. They did a good job, but there's still a little bit of cleanup. Nobody learns how to wet sand someone else's muscle car one day. But you get to do it here if you come down to your, your class. You get to. I mean, this. What is that's an old. That's what? a street rod, 1937 yeah. Ford Slantback. This is a '63 Plymouth Fury. They both have brand new paint jobs. That's single stage. This is base coat, clear coat, and the class. Hand sanded them, machine sanded them, rotary them, then polished them out with orbitals. Not bad. All in one day? All in, well, in a half a day. Half a day. Yeah, before lunch, they started at uh, 8 o'clock and finished by lunch because then we went to hot water extractors and steam machines. Wow, see what you get to learn if you come to one of Mike, Mike's uh, three boot day camp. Class. Yeah, boot camp. camp. I, I, I was about ready to say boat class because you're doing a boat class next week. Next week's the boat class. We're going to be machine sanding and hand sanding in it too. See, you get put to work if you come down here. A lot of sanding. <laughs> a lot of sanding. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to do my little spiel as normal. If you haven't already, subscribe, subscribe, like, ring the bell, share, tell every all your friends, have a party if you really smash want to. Smash the like button. Smash the, oh, smash it. I That's like that. Hulk says. smash. Uh, Hulk smash. So today we're doing uh, a topic that we had a video on. One of our one of our most popular ones is about polishers. Polishers. And so we're going to take that video a little bit deeper. We're going to twist it. Yeah. Instead of being a nice fluffy video, we're going to go yeah, deep. Yeah. We're, it's going to be a deep dive. <laughs> we're going to go deep down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So with that being said, I'm going to head that way. Mike's going to head this way, and we're going to start this show off. Okay. Polishers. Everybody likes to polish. Uh, should I put some gloves on so I can hold these tools? Oh, stop. Stop. <laughs> I want to look like a professional, so let me put some nitrile gloves on. So you got baby blue ones? Yeah, because I thought they'd show up good on camera. Right. There. Now I'll look like all the famous detailers when I grab a tool. All right, there you go. I got you okay. set up. What we have here is pretty much the full array of tools that we currently sell here at AutoGeek, or at least sell a lot of. And um, I mean, there's probably some out there in the air power DA range that they get kind of dusty because we don't really carry it to the body shop world and most people shouldn't be sanding in their cars. So as far as electric polishers go, this is a pretty good collection of what's used in the market today, what's available in the market today, and what we sell here at AutoGeek today. And the way I've divided these up is instead of trying to explain them to you as a beginner polisher or, or which intermediate other video did. or an advanced, which is what our other video was, and it doesn't really make sense, is I have them divided up by the type of tool they are. So these are short stroke, free spinning, random orbital polishers. These are, I guess, medium stroke because they're 12 millimeter. And these are long stroke, free spinning, random orbital polishers. Over here are gear-driven short stroke orbital polishers. Notice there's no word random in there. Can you there. move that flashlight for me? Oh, yeah, yeah. I brought this out because I thought I'd share something old. <laughs> and then these are rotary polishers. And so it's a pretty good collection about every kind of tool there. I'm going to walk you through how they work. And uh, if you and were, if, what, what scenario that you'd use them in, or they yeah, where selling? you'd use them, who they'd be good for, uh, what they're capable of. Good. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, about the various tools, or maybe you'd like to explain, hey, I'm an enthusiast, which tool would be best for me? Hey, I'm a pro, I want to take my game to a higher level, which would be good for me? I mean, we'll do our best to answer them. By the way, this is one, not the original, but this is one of the original Swirl Finder lights. <laughs> This is actually a copy of the one that um, Blue Point put out. Blue Point's a division of Snap-on, and my friend Joe Fernandez and uh, Jason Rose from Rupes, they both found this Blue Point Swirl Finder light that was black that looked like this, and then I think about a year later, this one from Brinkman showed up, and this was the rage for about 10 years. Yeah, you had that thing in everything. I've got a bunch of these that still work. This one, the battery doesn't work. By the way, Dennis Gage actually has the first one I gave him in 2010, and it actually still works. It's incredible. So anyway, antique products in the detailing world. They call that car wax history. Okay, so over here, let's take a look at what we got here first. Just dive in. Porter Cable, been around for, I don't know, maybe 40 years. This started out as a wood sander, and a lot of you guys already know that. 
And there's a lot of wood sanders on the market, but the thing that separated this wood sander from all the rest was the ability to rotate a foam pad under pressure, okay? So most wood sanders, if you think about it, are, in fact, you could grab me one of those uh, 3M uh, Trizac six inch discs. There's a couple laying out. Most, uh, you gotta, let me break this down. Most wood sanders are designed to oscillate and rotate a thin sanding disc. And over the, Last 20 years I've been typing online answers. I can't tell you how many people have come and asked me, hey Mike, I don't got a Porter Cable wood sander, but I've got a, this brand wood sander. Can I just go ahead and use it to polish the paint on my car? And the answer was always no. It doesn't have the power to rotate a foam buffing pad. And here's the difference. Here's the sanding disc. Look how thin it is. Here, I'll put it down on my shirt. And then look how thick a foam pad is. And this is actually a thin foam pad. They used to be a lot thicker when the Porter Cable was oh, first God, yeah. <laughs> introduced. Well, the original. Inch and a half. The, 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 the pad that comes with the Porter Cable is like two inches thick. Yeah, it's like two inches <laughs> thick. There was this uh, pad that was sold called the Swirl Buster. It was four inches thick. And what the joke was is the guy that, you know, discovered it in Germany and was selling it wasn't a detailer, so he had no understanding of the fact that all that thick foam was going to absorb the power coming out of the tool and dissipate it, and that would show up to no pad rotation. But anyway, so this is a wood sander. It's an eight millimeter wood sander. And eight millimeter is what eight, for those people that don't know? Eight millimeter is five sixteenths. No, 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 no. Oh. What, what, what is oh, that? Oh, okay. Measuring? So as the pad is spinning in a circle. It's making another circle inside that circle, and the diameter of that circle is eight millimeters, or roughly five sixteenths of an inch. It's very small. Okay, so that's the Porter Cable. And what I think is interesting is both McGuire's and Richard Grio over at Grio's both introduced this, I think, in the late 1980s to the paint polishing world. So there uh, were air power DAs that would do the same thing, like the 3M palm sander, uh, but they most people don't have a, an air compressor big enough t to run that. Yeah, I mean, you need a monster. It's, well, I always tell people a, a good average would be at least a 60 gallon air tank to feed a, any kind of air tool. All air tools, by the way, are air hogs, even small ones. So this was a tool uh, that anybody could plug into the wall and actually it got everybody away from rotary buffers and it enabled the average person, here's the plug-in, it, averaged, it enabled the average person to de-swirl their car or become a detailer, and it was a, it's a simple tool. And I like them because they're built like a truck. You can drop it, drive over the truck, pick it up, and keep on buffing. They are a very good tool. They're a little bit compared to some of these other tools that are a little bit on the weak side, but if you're just an enthusiast, it's a good beginner polisher. Agreed. Okay. Down the road a ways, McGuire's, McGuire's started out with this tool. Then they had a, a, their own tool made called the G100, the G110, the G220. And then from that, the evolution of tools came the MT300. Now, this is the same idea. This is an 8 millimeter free spinning random orbital polisher. So it does the same thing this does, only they give it a little sexier look with some great graphics, uh, what they call a hoop handle or a D handle, a longer uh, tool chassis overall, and just some nice features. So, but it's still that same category, free spinning, eight millimeter, random orbital polisher. Then, Griot's Garage had a polisher out called, the, we everybody called it the GG6, and Griot's called it the six inch random orbital polisher, which in a way was kind of misleading because the six stood for how big the backing plate was, which has nothing to do with the operation of the tool. They should have called it the GG8, like they do the, 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 the new tool they got now, and the eight stands for eight millimeter. But it was basically a copy of the Porter Cable, and they did away with it about, what, two years ago now? I think it's about two years ago, yeah. And they introduced the new G9 and the G8, and this time they named them correctly. So the G8 is a smaller, is a, has a smaller backing plate and has an eight millimeter random orbital free spinning action. So it's the same basic as this tool and this tool. Just a smaller size. Just a smaller backing plate and a little bit more uh, compact lightweight size body so you could get into do thin panels of the body of the tool being in the way. And you can also put a two inch backing plate on here to get a smaller pad again to do thin panels like you see on modern cars or on windows, things like that. Motorcycles now, yeah, and other things. Exactly. And now the G9 is a nine millimeter 
random, free spinning random orbital polisher. And both these have, I think, 1,000 watt motors. They got a ton of power over all their predecessors. Well built, they got what they call a platypus handle, solid one piece construction, a lot of uh, rubber, uh, rubberized grip stations here to help it, to make it easier to hold on to. And um, a variable speed dial, it's on both sides, you know, a unique trigger, a removable cord. You can plug this into any of the new Boss polishers, the, the uh, Grios polishers. Just a lot of really cool, well thought out features like the way they circulate the air to keep the, not only to keep the motor and the internals cool, but also keep the vacuum plate and the pad cool. So this is the latest evolution in short stroke polishers. And out of the three, the, 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 the three full-size models are up here. This one does have the most power, has a lifetime warranty. And if you're new into machine polishing, this would be a great choice. So that would be a beginner polisher. It'd be a but beginner polisher. But it's also strong enough for a professional. That's right. That's right. And um, um, while I prefer to do my machine sanding with the shorter, uh, stockier, lightweight Porter cable, this is completely capable of doing machine sanding. You just got this longer body tool overall to deal with. So uh, one of the things I always liked about the Porter cable is if you're not using a pneumatic DA, it's a great electric version. Um, of a pneumatic DA to machine sand with. Now, kind of tucked in between here, I'm gonna space these out a little bit. Well, there's a million and one polishers up there, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tucked in between there are the Rupes Duetto and the Rupes Mini. Now these are 12 millimeter, free spinning, random orbital polisher. And the way you can tell any polisher is either gear driven or free spinning is just simply take your hand, your fingers, and if you can rotate, rotate the backing plate or the pad, that's the visual indicator and the physical indicator that it's a free spinning. It's not gear driven. All right, I got, I got a quick question for you. Um, how, where does it go from short stroke to long stroke? Where's that? I think Jason Rose, I had him on the phone today. I should have asked them where they draw the line, but because G, the G9 is considered short stroke, and here's a 12, and this is considered long stroke. That fuzzy area between long stroke and short stroke, I'm gonna say is somewhere in the 10 range, okay. 10 or 11. So single digits is short stroke, anything over that is That's probably- That's a good way to put it. Okay. Yeah, next time I'm talking to Jason, you know, I'm happy to let other guys be the experti experts on, you know, defining mm -hmm. what the short stroke and long stroke is. But definitely we could say these are short stroke, these are long stroke, and these two are kind of in that little happy gray area. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I know that this, this is a really nice tool for doing thin panels, kind of like the, the Griot's G8. The, the Duetto, I'll just give you my take. I really wanted to love this tool. Um, I like the compact size and lightweight because look, it's basically shaped like a Porter cable. When it first came out, I mean, I was just like, wow, cool, this is a great tool. The problem with it is, is it kind of suffers with the same problem any free spinning tool has, and that's the ability to rotate, keep a pad rotating. So, you know, down the road, I just like the Bigfoot went through the, the Legacy, then the Mark II, then the Mark III. I expect to see, um, or I hope to see, that an evolution in this tool. Maybe they'll tweak it somehow to help it in the pad rotation because everything else about it is great. Now, this is called the Cyclo, and this is a tool and a tool company that Rupes bought. So Rupes is an I Italian company, and they bought the Cyclo tool company in now, what's Colorado. You, what's unique about that tool? Um, What's unique about this is the dual heads, okay? And it's 15 millimeter. But what's really unique about it is it's, it's free spinning, but it's also gear driven. So I, I don't know if you can see this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm this gonna- It's plugged in, I have that one plugged well, in. Well, I'm gonna- Oh, hear it? Can okay. you hear the gears? Yep. But I physically have to grab it and oscillate these. And they are, this part is gear driven, but this part is free spinning. So it's kind of a hybrid. And um, this is the, the latest Mark II, and it has a variable speed dial, which really helps for like, uh, if you want to spread your product out. The original version went from zero to 3,000, so it, it was kind of a product slinger. And it's, it's very, very safe. I mean, even on my hands here, look it. I can just dial it, that it's thing like a down massager. to nothing. <laughs> now let me turn the speed up so it happens. Still very safe, not hurting my nitrile glove. Now we're starting to go nuts. They're full out.
And that gap from here to there, that's 15 millimeters. All right, now Mike, doesn't that come with extra tools that you can do more things with it? Good than just point. You can buy four different brushes for it. You can buy a couple different like scrubby pads. And then it comes with an array of, I think, five different foam pads. So anything from soft finishing to aggressive cutting. And I think there's also wool pads and microfiber pads available. The wool pads are from Cyclo, but I think there are some also some four inch microfiber pads that also fit this tool. Now, the one thing that makes this tool unique besides the dual heads is that when you're buffing with it, with any of these other tools when you're buffing, you just have to monitor the one backing plate, the one pad. With this one, now you're not only trying to follow the panel and do all the things you gotta do, but you also gotta look and monitor two pads rotating. And when you're running this, there's actually, let me turn this down so I don't hurt myself. There's kind of this space in between that doesn't really get a lot of uh, mechanical action like as far as correction and polishing. So I always teach my students to tilt it a little bit as you're making a pass, and that way you get 100% coverage. That makes sense. Yeah, I used to, this came out I think in 1951 or 1952, shortly after World War II, and the two guys that developed this actually developed this to polish out aluminum, like on aluminum warplanes, without putting holograms or swirls into the aluminum. So that's kind of its history. And then of course, they found out it worked just as good to polish paint for the same reasons. And I think at one time, Sears had in their catalog a mount that would attach this to the back of your a door in your house, and it was a back massager. Oh my God. So it has a very <laughs> colorful history. And did it a lot of people always use that for like Airstream trailers? Airstream trailers and, and uh, like uh, Joe Fernandez buffs out the big B-24 bombers yep. that are aluminum. Uh, because of the, it, it mimics hand polishing is what it does. And so it's not like a rotary, so it doesn't really put swirls of scratches in. Um, and speaking of that, if you see my old fashioned orbital, which I think is up there on the stage, I will show the first three tools that's all we had to cho choose from as we wrap up. The Makita? No, it's uh, uh, no, not the Makita. You can bring the Makita, but I think I have a TOB up there, oh, traditional okay. orbital buffer. It's the one like a steering wheel. Yeah. Oh, I see it. Okay. Okay. So um, back to the Cyclo. I used to teach a dedicated class for the Cyclo. So we had like 25 of these in the garage, so, you know, the new version, the old version. And I'd bring in two cool cars like this in the class and kind of go through it. As more tools like the Boss system, the new Bigfoot system, uh, uh, were introduced to the market, um, I had to cut something out, and the Cyclo was one of the first ones to go. It's still a capable tool. It's a great balanced tool. It's American-made. A lot of people love it. But there just became no time in my three-day class to bring in two more cars. We did, we did 14 cars this last class. In September, we did 17 cars, and it's going to be really hard to bring in two more and carve the time out to do a dedicated Cyclo. But I always have these out in the class for anybody to test out. They are there. I can verify. Yep. Okay, and just to kind of show you, in the early days of car detailing, these were the three choices you had. It, you had rotary, traditional orbital, and Cyclo. This, just these three. None of this other stuff existed. These other tools all kind of rest on the shoulders of the Porter Cable. Okay. Because this is the thing that kind of started it all as far as do-it-yourself orbitals, enthusiasts, and even professionals being able to turn out swirl-free finishes and by getting away from the rotary. But this is just, uh, they call this a steering wheel orbital. See, it's got a button back here, big bonnet. You would change the bonnet material from lamb's wool to a cotton to microfiber, depending on what you wanted to do. And these worked actually really well in the old days with single stage paint, because the problem with single stage paint is it oxidizes. And if you throw an aggressive bonnet on here and some you know, caveman compound, it'll sit there and grind all that, that dead paint off and leave a pretty good shine. The problem with this idea is on modern clear coats because the paints are harder. If you try that, you may remove the swirls and scratches, but you end up kind of uh, scouring the paint. It depends <laughs> on the abrasive technology used, but also it's slow. The OPMs is slow. The pad is big. It doesn't fit modern body style. So it's, it's just an antiquated, we call it a wax spreader. And, um, but, but the thing about this is, I'm gonna put this over here, is you can go down to any uh, parts store or big box store and find things that look like this for like 30 bucks. So a lot of people get them as gifts or they buy them and then they go through that evolution of finding out that it really can't do anything but lay down a coat of <laughs> wax to paint already in good shape.
And it's a paperweight. <laughs> <laughs> I've been packing that run around 20 years because and whenever I teach a class in variable, there'll be someone in the class that says, hey, Mike, I don't got one of those tools, but I got one of these. Can I just use it? And the answer is no. <laughs> and then I explain why. And this is my original rotary I purchased myself in 1987. And it was the first, can you get this? The first variable speed rotary. There's the dial right there. Variable speed. Before that, rotaries were grinders. They were one speed, and then they advanced it to two speed, a high and a low. And then Makita introduced the rotary with the variable speed. And if you want to listen, I used this all the way up until the day it quit, the gears quit meshing. Listen, I'll put it here. Oh, they're supposed to sound like that. <laughs> I buffed until it completely gave up. And I, I, I use it so much, I actually polished this sand cast aluminum smooth like a piece of chrome. And that meant um, I wore it off with my skin because it's textured like sand, a sand cast mold. And I wore the ribs off all the handle. So I buffed out a lot of cars with this thing. And I always tell people, if you're going to take a class on how to use the rotary buffer, uh, take, a, take the class from a guy that's actually used one. Do you and need a tissue? I can, I can prove it, too. See, I've got the polisher. Nowadays, nowadays, you can't do that because everything has a rubber overmold. You'll, no one can ever wear sand cast aluminum down with their skin of their hands because th the tools just don't exist. OK, so that's short stroke, the first 15 millimeter. And now we've got. We've got a hybrid tool here. The we can Udos. come back to that one. We'll come back to that one. Yeah, we'll come well, back to I just, this one. Because we didn't have room on the other table. Gotcha. That's, that's kind of a, a hybrid tool of everything you see here. But then there became the Rupes 15 Bigfoot, Bigfoot 15. This is the Mark III. And then Grayos introduced their 15 Bigfoot. And then Flex, or not Bigfoot, just uh, Boss. And then Flex introduced the finisher, 15 millimeter. So all of these basically spin in a circle, and then they rotate the pad in an offsetting motion that has an orbit stroke of 15 millimeters. And I think you, do you have this one plugged in? You have the Bigfoot plugged in. Yeah. Let's just take a look at what 15 millimeters looks like. Then maybe the 21 is also plugged in, so okay. that way you can put a comparison. OK, so this, this, I call this the, the ghosting image. So there's a circle here, and there's an outer perimeter circle here. And this is what has backing plate behind it, so lots of correction. And this is kind of nothing behind it. But that distance there is 15 millimeters. So it gives you a visual of what we're talking about. And again, this, this was 15 millimeters too. There you go. And one thing that's really nice about the Rupes tools is uh, I've been to the Milan factory before they purchased Cyclo. And I, I was one of the fortunate people that was able to go through the, the, the actual manufacturing plant. And actually, the first person that uh, Guido, the president of Rupes, let me take pictures. And I wrote a complete article on this. And the first picture I took of, I took while I was in the manufacturing plant, was the sign on the wall that had a picture of a camera with a circle and the line through it that said, no Breaking pictures. And Guido said, Mike, for you, you can take pictures. So there's a full <laughs> write-up that exists to this day of how they make their tools. And they make everything in their tools, the bodies, the motors, I mean, everything. And they're very well-balanced, lightweight, compact, quiet, smooth. Do you want to go over the balancing thing? Uh, um, yeah, I'll show you something. I'd like to do the 21 with that because it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit more um, um, tactical when someone wants to feel it. But this is something I call the air test. So this is the 21. That's not plugged in. Um, well, we can try with this one. Anyway, one day when I was over in uh, Norway at the Rupes uh, Bigfoot, I forget yeah, what they call no, it, yeah, conference. I remember that. You were, yeah. yeah. I actually had a chance to show this to engineers. I don't think they'd ever seen it before. But um, when talking about how smooth they are, I have this on. There's the force setting. And if I just hold it like this, I call this the air test. It's in the air. It's vibrating, OK? It's not meant to be held in the air without a pad. Sorry, everybody. I do not have feel-a-vision. OK. Now you put the Rupes designed pad on there and do the same air test. Boom. It's smooth as can be. And the point about this is, is 
the Rupes engineers, they look at things differently than I think other engineers. Not only did they want to make a tool that was, was an effective functional tool, but they wanted to create a tool that was easy on the human being. That you know, that you, when you're spending hours buffing out a car, that your hands didn't feel like they've been vibrated off. Make the user experience better. Yeah. So they looked at the whole tool as a system, which includes the pad, the weight of the backing plate, the action of the tool itself. And when you put it together as a system, it's like beautiful music. It just works perfectly. And the reason I show this to people is because a lot of people think when you buy, say, a Rupes polisher, that you can slap any old pad on there and it should work just as good. I mean, isn't a pad a pad? But that's wrong. <laughs> And that's why I wrote Not this. all pads are created equal. Well, they're different weights, they're different densities, they're different sizes and shapes. And even though that can seem like a small thing, I always tell people the little things are the big things, okay? And the type of pad you put on that tool is very, um, is a in huge influence or factor to the performance of the tool. So the reason I wrote that article called The Air Test, if you type into Google The Air Test and then Mike Films, you'll pull it up. It's also in my Rupes book. But the reason I did that was so anytime I meet people that are going, well, I bought that Rupes tool and it just ain't working. First thing I say is, what kind of pads are you using? And of course they think, you know, something's wrong with me because a pad is a pad. And uh, you put the right pad on there and all of a sudden that tool is going to perform at maximum efficiency. Now, so, have you tried that with other polishers? I have tried that with other polishers that are, say, a copy of the Rupes. And what's interesting is the, uh, the Griot's polishers are a very good, not only a very good copy, but also in some aspects of refinement and improvement over it. And I have found that they actually are smoother with the Rupes pad because if it's a if it's a if it's a if it's a, a if precise it's engineered replica of the original, then it makes sense that the pad that was meant for the original will work just as good as the replica. I got you. And the the boss pads are really, really thin. Mm -hmm. So actually their boss tools are smoother with Rupes pads than the boss pads. And that's just actually a compliment to what a great job they did of replicating the Rupes tool in the Boss line. So anyway, uh, but anyway, so 15 millimeters. So we got three of them here. We got the finisher cordless. And um, this, the, the, battery, the battery technology for flex tools is unparalleled. You know, um, I've had discussions with people on the internet, which is always fun. Uh, yeah. on other tools out there and their battery capabilities. And the problem with them is, is yeah, you can say they're all the same thing, but it's not true. The batteries don't last as long and they take much longer to recharge because this uses smart recharging technology. There's a fan in here that pulls air through the battery to keep it cool. The battery actually has a circuit. It talks to the tool, it talks to the charger. It's just not a rechargeable battery, okay? There's a lot going on here. And you know, Flex is like the, the Mercedes Benz of polishers, you know, so they, before they launch a product, they do their homework. But I've gotten 40 minutes out of the five amp battery easy on all their tools. Now, one of the things about the finisher is it comes from the factory with a much smaller backing plate. It's a five inch. This is a, a optional six inch. And through my own experience, and I teach a lot of classes, I just find with the larger pad, it's easier to maintain, maintain pad rotation. And the reason I attribute to that is the word inertia. In fact, let me grab a larger pad and I will show you. Oh, we have uh, Jan Anderson. He's like, hope to see you in Norway again. That was a lot of fun going yes, over there. Yes, we want to go back. I absolutely loved Norway. I loved the reindeer pizza. Uh, no, the reindeer was good. <laughs> the reindeer was good, actually. Meeting a lot of real cool cats over there, too, with the Rupes team. Okay, so this is a Flex Force hybrid pad. It's fairly thick, good mass, and I'll tell you, this thing actually rotates pretty good on this tool. You had to pick a black one. Uh, because it's a finishing pad. All right. And that's another thing I wanted to point out. I've actually met people that have bought this tool thinking they were going to do heavy correction. Um, it's called it's the finisher. Called the, can you zoom in on that? The finisher. It's called the finisher. Where do you have it? It's not... Oh, right, right there. there. Right. It's not called the concrete grinder <laughs> or the heavy paint correction tool. That's the beast. So this is the finisher. It's for doing finishing work. And um, I don't, honestly, I don't use this tool much. I tend to, um, if I'm going to go free spinning, I will tend to either grab something like the G9, the Porter Cable, or one of my favorite free spinning tools, the Bigfoot 21 Mark III. Uh, but that's 15 millimeter. Then you got, of course, the, the Bigfoot 15 millimeter and the Boss 15 millimeter. And side by side, all these tools are really going to do the same job. They're really for doing, well, they're best at doing finishing work. 
But the Boss tools and the Bigfoot tools are actually um, marketed for doing heavy correction. The key with these tools is using the correct pad so they fit the body panel you're working with so you're able to maintain pad rotation. Okay, question. Sure. All right, so why, what's the difference, when, or when would you want to do uh, a long throw opposed to a short throw? What would be the reason well, for that? Well, my, my, when I would do it is if I was doing finishing work on something with large flat panels, like say this 1963 Plymouth Fury. Say I was working on a motorhome, lots of big flat panels. But it's really, for, for me, it's finishing work. Now, I under, completely understand that someone with good skills could wet sand a demo hood with 2000 grit and pull it out with any of these free spinning tools. I, I get that. In the real world, when you wet sand an actual car, not a demo hood, you have body lines, you have uh, edges, you've got smaller, complicated panels you gotta get into, and for that, you throw a wool pad on a rotary buffer and you're able to get the job done in a sane amount of time. <laughs> sane, um, keyword. But that's also why when I teach my sanding classes, I don't use demo hoods, I use actual cars because it has impact on the people taking the class. Usually what it does is it scares the hell out of them to ever try this on their own. But I mean, it, it's so easy to have a flat hood and show someone to sand and buff on it. But that's that real world too. But this, there's no impact with that. It's not like buffing around an antenna or a door handle. You, when you sand that stuff, teaching guys how to sand up there around the fresh air grill, around the uh, rear view mirror, the door handles. I mean, that is some complicated stuff, and that, that's what my class is like. My, I used to do the, the demo hood thing. I did it at McGuire's. I did it when I came here. But you don't, you can't really teach any of the hard stuff with it. You just teach easy stuff. Anybody, a kid could sand down the middle of a hood and pull it out with any of these polishers. So it's, you know, it is what it is, but. All right, I got a question right here, and it actually ties into with what you're talking about. Uh, Rupes 15 or 21, what do you use more? Do you use the, or it doesn't have to be the Rupes, but mm -hmm. do you use a 15 or uh, uh, 15 um, or 21? If I'm going to use a free spinning tool, long stroke, I use the 21. Okay. And but that's again, that would be the on the right, that... personal preference on the right car. It's got to be the right car. But there's a couple things you can do. Remember, I told you I sent you that link if you use, oh. you spend any, enough. To, I was if, looking that up. Hold on. Uh, if you spend enough time, I have an article. Here's the title. Hold on. If you spend enough time with any tool, you can make a dance on paint. And in that article I'm are pictures it. of um, a well, lady that took my class taking the Bigfoot 21 up on edge, buffing out a thin panel, about an inch wide on a 1965 Mustang. And uh, that's I, the point uh, of the article. If you spend enough time with the tool, you can make it do it, whatever you want to do. Most people think if they plug it in, turn it on, they should be an expert that minute. And that's just not going to happen. Are you talking about right by the windshield? Um, scroll down a little ways. You see an elderly lady on a Mustang? Uh, well, I see. A, oh, right there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's a tw Bigfoot 21 with a seven inch pad buffing out a piece of paint about an inch, inch wide yeah. right there by the, the hood, the hood of the door, uh, the hood in the top of the fender. Yep. And I showed her how to do it with the nano tool. But I says, hey, sometimes if you got one tool, you got to make that tool do what you want it to do. And the key to that is having a good backing plate and a good pad so you have strong pad attachment so the pad don't go flying off and you grind that backing plate into some other guy's muscle car, <laughs> which we did not do in that class. <laughs> but and then I showed the same thing using the flex, going up on edge with the gear driven tool, going yep, up on that edge. That was one of the first ones yeah. that I showed. So, uh, but that's the point is, you know, any of these tools will do what you want to do, but you have to spend the time to become good with it. What is that, a 10,000 hours then you become? I don't know, <laughs> way too many hours for me. Anyway, so those are the 15s, very capable tools. And uh, the thing I wanted to talk about also with the Rupes, a lot of people don't know this. So here's the, here's the 15, here's the 21, here's the Mini and the Duetto, up here's the Nano. Rupes, the way they went to market, and this is what most people don't know, but I explain this in my Rupes how-to book. What Rupes wants you to do is buy all the tools. You don't got to do it all at once, but the idea is, is whatever the panel size is, let me grab a seven inch pad here again, whatever the panel size is, say it's a big panel, you use the 21. You got a thin panel like the top of a fender, you switch over to the 15. You got a really thin panel, maybe you go to the mini or you break out the nano. Okay. Well, it's just like if you're a pro, uh, professional mechanic or if exactly. you're a mechanic period, you, you have the right tool to do the right job. Exactly. So. And I've been telling this people for years, you, you get all the tools, you get all their pads, all their chemicals, and you become an expert with their system. Yes. And once you become an expert with their system, you don't need anything else. If you want to start experimenting with someone else's pad or chemicals, go for it. But if it isn't working, you have the system to come back to to finish the car in front of you. But that, that was their idea, was making 
you know, that's why you have a different range of tools to match the panel size, okay? Makes and sense. when you have people that go out and replicate their, their system, they never incorporated that, okay? So there's a lot of people out there that got a 15 and a 21, but they don't got any other tools to complement that. And so if you take their 15 and 21 and you're buffing a thin panel and you can't maintain pad rotation, and the Rupa system, you got that beat. But in other systems, you can't. Now, Boss and Grios, they did fix that with, of course, the G9 and the, G, the, G, the G8. Right. And actually, they brought out the GR3, which is a rotary that you could put a one-inch pad. So they have replicated it. Well, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about there's a lot of companies out there that got just a 15 and a 21. And they, because they copied Rupes, they don't understand, Rupes had a bigger picture in mind, and a complete picture. I, I got to bring this one up. This is funny. And I know this is somebody that you, you look up to a little bit in the industry. He's been around for a while, but I just thought his comment was funny. Mel Craig, I want to learn how to polish cars. Is it hard to do? Laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to start on someone else's car. <laughs> hey, Mel. Hope it's all good out there in Cali. Hey, Mel. It's good to hear from you, buddy. You've been in this a long time, and um, my guess is you've probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. So I love that cliche, by the way. Okay, so here we got two 21s. Uh, this is the, the Rupes Bigfoot Mark III. Again, one of my favorite tools. It's just so smooth. Here's the new, this is the new Boss. It's their latest uh, version, the Boss 21. And same idea, you know, very smooth tool. A lot of features built in. These are both very capable, long stroke polishers. And um, again, they're really designed for larger, flatter panels. But if you get real good with it, you can start tackling some curved panels or get into some thin areas. Again, a lot of times what's really important is that you got a good backing plate and a good pad where the Velcro and the hook, the hook and uh, loop have good attachment strength. So if you start doing things like just buffing with the portion of the face of the pad, it don't go flying off. And what a lot of people don't know is Velcro wears out, okay? These hooks here. Don't sue us, Velcro. Every time you pull a pad off, you know, you're stretching them, you're wearing them, and they wear out. And uh, the same thing on the, the hook side, or the loop side, the hook wears out. It becomes really fuzzy, like a big mess. And there's just not an attachment strength there. And um, Let me, I, I want to point that out just because some people think it should last forever. But the one thing we both know, Yancey, is nothing lasts forever, not even you and I. No, we don't. Um, also, what do you call it? Um, let me bring this up because I know it was mentioned in your class, but maybe you should talk about it here, is the, the action of the long throws are actually more violent on your yeah. pads opposed to like the eight or the, the smaller ones down below. Let me hold up the eight millimeter versus the 21 and let's look at yeah. that ghosting yeah. image. Then maybe if you explain the reason why that it, they're a little bit harder on your um, pads. Okay, so here's nine millimeter and here's, here's that ghosting image. Here's the outer perimeter, the inner perimeter. Very small. Can they see that, Yancy? Yeah. Okay, here's 21. Here's the inner perimeter, the outer perimeter, that's 21 millimeters. So here they are together. See the difference? Yeah. And the larger that stroke, the more violent that action is because it's covering more distance. And the action of an orbital polisher is violent in and of itself. And so um, one of the things, Yancey, a lot of people know that I try to teach is when you're going to buff out a car to have a lot of pads. A, a good rule of thumb Pad if you're doing panel. any. Yeah, for correction work. So if you're using a compound or an AIO, AIO is done for correction too, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you're, doing, when you're doing correction work with a compound or AIO, you should really have one pad per panel. Because what's going to happen is the pad, when you're working with foam, the pad's going to become saturated with product, and there's a whole bunch of negative things that are going to happen with that. Here. One is it throws the weight off. What's that for? Dirty pad. Oh, oh, dirty pad. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going somewhere with that. Okay, so your pad's going to build up with two things. Removed paint, spent product. Okay, the, if you're using a compound or an AIO with abrasives, after you work it for a while, everything's starting to wear out the, in, inside that compound or that AIO or a polish. And if you're abrading the surface, you have paint coming off. So you have two things building up on the face of the pad. But when you put some product on the face of the pad, and then you put that down onto the finish, because remember, aren't we supposed to put the pad against the paint before mm. we turn it on or you'll throw product? Yes, sir. For that brief moment, 
that product you put that's on the face is now being pushed into the foam. Okay, if you repeat that over and over again, product on against the paint, product on against the paint, and you turn it on, now you've got this violent oscillating orbital action and you're usually pressing on it. You, Everything's you, working against you. You have <laughs> everything working against the pad. It's gonna become saturated. Liquid holds in heat better than air, so a wet pad's gonna get hotter than a dry pad. And then you have the factor called time. Okay, so if you're doing like eight or 10 section passes, that's a lot of time. It's gonna generate a lot of um, a violent action on the Velcro, on the adhesive that holds the backing to the foam and to the foam itself. And of course, again, it's loaded up with liquids, and, you know, and solvents and things like that. So there's nothing actually beneficial to buffing with a foam pad that's good for the pad. It's all, it's all detrimental, it just wears it out. And if you try to buff out a car with just one or two pads, because the liquid holds in heat better than air, it's gonna get hot. And what's gonna happen is basically you turn a foam cutting pad into a foam finishing pad that's soft and gushy. And you'll find out as you're working around the car that w even though it may have started out working really good, removing swirls and scratches, now it's taking you a lot longer. You're less effective. So it's better to have more pads. You, they'll last longer over time because you're not wearing them out. You'll do better work faster. See, there's only an upside to using more pads. Um, saturation problem. They still get wet, but it's not like, it's not like you got this thick of foam filled with liquid over the entire face of it, which is a lot of liquid. So uh, the key with the microfiber obviously is to clean those pads off and with compressed air. That's usually the best way. And then you could buff out a car with one or two pads, okay? So there's a huge difference in, in, in doing correction work with compounds and AIOs and even polishes with thin microfiber pads versus thick foam pads. Okay, on that topic, could you use a This microf is a brain dump. I know, we're, we're going deep, we told you. Um, now, for the long stroke, would it be, could you use, what do you call it, the microfiber pads on that? Or? Oh yeah, there's plenty of companies that make those. Okay, All right, just the, that way if people know, yep. want to know. And here's the difference between microfiber versus foam. The, the really big picture is fibers are a form of abrasive. If we come over here to Mr. DeWalt, can you see that color, everybody? What color is that, Yancey? That is ugly color. That's, that, it's orange. Orange and yellow. What color is that 37 behind me? Oh, well, that's orange. I told everybody at the start of this video, that's single stage urethane. Not lacquer, not enamel. It's modern paint, but it just has no clear. And Are you beating up that thing? I'm trying to get some fibers. <laughs> so I pulled these fibers off. Where are you putting them? I'll put them on this black thing right here. Okay, can you get that? And focus, yep. Okay, so anytime you're cutting with a fiber pad, be it a wool pad, a microfiber pad, a synthetic pad, whatever it is, the fibers, the individual fibers like my fingers, they're gonna cut the paint. They're gonna put cuts so in the So they're an abrasive. Because they're an abrasive. And, and that's a good thing if you're trying to find a way to do your paint correction quicker and get away from foam, you know, just do it quicker, fiber will cut faster than foam. Um, but the problem is, is when you try to finish with fiber and you're working on a medium to soft paint, the fibers are still cutting it, so you wipe off and see micro marring. Okay, so, so I always tell people, um, all things considered, you know, you always will finish out better with foam versus fiber, no matter what the paint system. Even harder paints, foam will finish out nicer. But that's the reason why, is fibers are abrasives, and they're always, as they're spinning against the paint, they're putting their own cut pattern in. So, um, anyway, good question. Okay, so those are the 15. Um, right here, smack dab in the middle, I got two common popular micro tools. We got the Flex Pixie, and we got the Angry Nano. <laughs> so Only Mike calls it the Angry pe Nano. People always wanna know why it's the Angry Nano, and it's really stupid. I have no artistic ability like Yancey, I can really only draw a happy face and stick people. I can barely write my name. Angry happy so faces. So I put the tape on here. I removed the shroud because it just gets in my way. I primarily use the long neck in rotary mode like that. I got no pad on there, but you see That's what I mean? Okay. And so I put a little tape around here so if I bump into something, I don't have metal against paint making a scratch. I try not to bump into things, but that's a safety. And then just for fun, because I take a lot of pictures and share them, I put the angry face on there. I think we need to make like a little silicone it's thing like that goes over that. Someone can make some money. You know, long, 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 long time ago, a guy named Richard Lynn actually made an adhesive piece of rubber that went around the Porter Cable Shroud. I forget what it was called, but uh, he used to sell tons of those things. See? Hey, there's my widget. Yep. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna make it. Um, this tool, both these tools come with three different, um, 
three different attachments that let you do oh, multiple I mean, things. So I'm over here um, meandering. Let me get in. I will put these in order. So there's rotary, rotary 12 millimeter, three millimeter. And that's the flex. Uh, yeah. Why don't you put the uh, tool kind of here, you like this? Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. Now okay. we're cooking our crust. Okay, and here's rotary uh, three millimeter, 12 millimeter. So rotary three millimeter, 12 millimeter. And on both these, uh, what they call these drive units or eccentric units, one of the things that's easy to identify if it's 12 or if it's three millimeters, you look at the size of the counterweight. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's much thicker, it's much bigger. It's heavier, it's 12 millimeters. It's gonna have a bigger throw, it's gonna need a bigger counterweight. Those are 12s, then here's three in both the different lines and the counterweight is uh, completely smaller, just so much different. That's a visual way. You could also memorize the color code for Rupes and with Flex you just have to memorize the shape and size. So both these are great micro tools and of course they give you the option of working in free spinning random orbital, your choice three millimeter, 12 millimeter, or in rotary mode. For the most part, you know, I'm just telling you straight up from experience, it doesn't do any good to blow smoke up anybody's uh, hey, career. Hey, hey. hey. <laughs> His career <laughs> is, uh, the three millimeters are pretty much, they just don't have no function. They, they really don't do a good job of maintaining pad rotation. They can be used if you can find a small sanding disc uh, for doing like dirt, uh, uh, what dirt. they call dust nib removal, you know, sanding little mm -hmm. dirt nibs like this. Both these cars had tons of little dirt specks in them. And you could, if you wanted to just have a small footprint, you could bring something like this down, a one inch pad off the one inch sanding disc and just focus right on the dirt nib and sand it out, then come back and pull your sanding marks out. So the three millimeter is good for machine wet sanding or even dry sanding. The 12 millimeter does a little better job on both these tools of maintaining pad rotation. So anytime you got a free spinning tool, here's a free spinning tool, you know, you have to uh, monitor to see if the pad's rotating because you hold it crooked. Uh, a lot of different factors taking place, shape of the panel. The pad can actually stall out and that'll happen on these micro tools also. For me, I usually use this in 12 millimeter, the Pixie, okay? So you, there's a whole lot of different backing or pads on the market. And this will actually do a pretty good job of maintaining pad rotation, the, the Pixie will in 12 millimeter. Hold it out away from your shirt because it's black on black. There we go. Okay, it actually does a pretty good job. Now I use this predominantly, the, the Nano in um, rotary mode. And I, of course use it for um, getting into tight thin panels. Um, I also, can I walk over here Yancy? You can do anything you want. Whenever I'm teaching glass polishing, I have a class coming up in two weeks on glass polishing through MTE, Mobile Tech Expo on a Thursday night. Remember we're doing that Yancy? Yes, we are. Okay, so I always teach glass polishing and when you have the larger tools with larger pads, it's hard to get into the tight areas. And the problem with not getting those is if the customer sees it rains, he'll see all this glass looking perfect, but you'll see this film around the edges. And any of you guys that have been doing this for a while, you know what I'm talking about. So what I'll usually do is called edging. I will edge the glass with the Nano and either a one inch foam cutting pad or microfiber pad and anybody's compound or anybody's glass polish. And that just gets in there. Then I come back with a big pad and I can be real quick, fast and sloppy and just knock it out. But that's where I really like the Nano is doing uh, what Jason Rose calls edge work getting close to the edges, but also polishing the perimeter of glass when I'm doing glass polishing. And I do like to throw the little brush on here. I have an article coming up where I use the brush to clean out some vintage Corvette emblems on the Corvette. You now, know, while really we're there are those polishers, could those could actually be classified along with the Udus as a hybrid polisher. A hybrid, yes, exactly. So why don't we segue to Let's segue to see, the, you see to what the I did Udos. there? Okay, so this is the LC Power Tools Udos. And there's no other tool like this on the market. And what makes this unique is it does five different actions with one tool. It does rotary, it does eight millimeter sanding, 12 millimeter, 15 millimeter, and 21 millimeter paint correction and polishing. All by simply adjusting the, the spring-loaded collar up here and selecting what action you want. And we do have a longer video on this. Uh, polish if you want to learn more about that polish. Yeah, and I, I've got a bunch of them back here, yep. so we show those in my classes. You get to use all these tools in my classes, so, uh, but that's a, that's a kind of a hybrid tool, and um, uh, it, but having five tools, you know, the big benefit of that is, is if you're a mobile detailer or even a fixed location, you know, you don't got to grab a different tool. Everything is in that one tool, and it 
one place. So that's the Udos. Okay, then we jump over here. Now we are in, we're back down to small orbit stroke length, but now these are gear driven. And one of the ways you can tell gear driven from free spinning, let me let me pick on. Uh, you can just pick anyone. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Rupes. So this is a 21, and I can instantly tell this is free spinning because I can take my hand and just spin that pad. And you don't hear anything. You don't hear nothing. You don't hear no gears meshing. Okay, here's the C beast. C B stands for cordless, the letter C cordless beast. That don't spin. I can spin it with my hand like this, and you can hear the gears. <laughs> that sounds so weird in my hand. <laughs> yeah. So so that's a gear driven tool. So here's the corded beast, which I call the supa beast. You can hear that. And that's pretty much the same tool as the 3401, the original. So and here's the original of the 3401. Oh, you have one up there. Okay. Same sorry. thing. Gear driven. These are all eight millimeter gear driven orbital polishers. Now, unlike when I described these, I left the word random out and the words free spinning. So those are free spinning, uh, random orbital polishers because the orbit stroke, the design they would make on a panel is very random. There's nothing, there's nothing stringent or uh, definite about it. It, it. The panel can actually alter how the pad is moving and it, it'll still rotate and make an orbit, but it, it can be all over the place, you know. With you wouldn't this be able one, to get the same drawing out of here to hook a pencil yeah. up to it. <laughs> yeah, Kevin Brown did that one, that's pretty cool. But with this, it's gear driven. Um, that The gears will determine exactly where that pad is going to rotate and orbit no matter what. It's gear driven. It has a, it's, it's gear driven orbital, not gear driven random orbital. Those you know are what random. We, did, we, we didn't do before we got in here? Uh, it's just because you just reminded me. Is all those that we've talked about first uh -huh. are very, very, very safe tools. Very safe. All right, so you know where I'm going, right? Yes, yes. All right, and so basically to demonstrate that, Mike is going to put his limbs to, to justify how safe these really are. Here, here's the G9, here's my hand. All right, at well. Okay, maybe banging it on you might hurt. It didn't hurt the glove and it didn't hurt me. All right, so now let's jump over and let's do the same thing with the uh, 341. No, we will not do that. <laughs> that would tear the glove up and then tear me up. But that's how, that's the difference yes. between the, the other ones. You could stop that pad. This one, yes. no. Years ago, I did that on a TV segment with uh, Brian Fuller on Two Guys Garage. Yep. And um, I think that sold a lot of tools because a lot of people don't know the things we... They were scared we, of it. They were scared that? of it. They were scared of it. Yeah, and scared that kind of it. took the scaredness well, well, away. Anybody watching this video is probably fairly knowledgeable in the detailing world, but the unwashed masses out there, the all couch right. potatoes, all they know is buffers swirl paint. <laughs> you know, and, and everything they think about at a buffer is, is right here. Okay, here's a buffer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and and I, all of them swirl paint because they're all, all the same as this. That's what the masses think. Uh, anyway, so we've got the, the Flex gear driven tools. Let me just talk about these. This is the original, it's called the Flex 30, XC 3401 BRG. Can you run up there and grab my uh, Flex book and my Rupes book and then I can explain where the name Beast came from. So when I wrote a book for the, for the Flex tool, and this is the only Flex tool in the paint polishing world there was at the time, of course it's grown by then. Whenever you write a book and then you sign it, like in a, a book signing, you know, usually you you sign something. You know, I always watch Barry McGuire say uh, uh, "car crazy," uh, Dennis Gage says "happy motoring." I mean, people that sign things usually have a cliche that they sign, and, and you got to have something because you can't just think it out every time if you got a lot of people in line. So when I wrote the Flex book, I'm sitting here, what can I write? What can I write? And I'm trying to think and be accurate. I'm going, you, you know why? Has one up there, this way. tool is a freaking beast. And that's why um, when I used to sign these, this is what I sign here. I go, the Flex 341 is a beast. Master the beast. So that's actually where the beast name came from. Now, when they introduced these other two polishers, first, the next one they introduced was the cordless beast. Being someone that types a lot, I'm not going to type out cordless beast, cordless beast. So I just shortened it to C beast, the cordless beast. And when this came out, one of my friends on the forum, I think it was Dan Tran, he called it the super. S-U-P-E-R-B, and I kind of liked Supa, 
to make it because you just like to be different. To, well, make it kind of ghetto. Well, look at Ragtop. R A ghetto. Ghetto. Yes, make it kind of ghetto. <laughs> oh God. Kind of trendy. Kind of kind of <laughs> earthy. I, don't I think know. we need to we need to inform you on what ghetto means. <laughs> Maybe I need to take your glass. <laughs> yeah. So I call it the super, the super beast. So you got the beast, the super beast, and the sea beast. They all do the same thing. Eight millimeter gear driven. And here's the thing. This one's going away. They're phasing this out. If you want, this has the highest OPM, the highest RPM of all the beasts, so it has the most power, but these are pretty close to it. And here's what I tell people, if I got a car and I really need to knock it out fast and it's in really bad shape, I'm grabbing the beast all day long. If I got a car that's in pretty good shape and I'm not in a hurry, I grab the super beast. And if I got a car that's in good shape and I don't have, I'm not in a hurry, then uh, there's nothing like going cordless. <laughs> But I, I, I choose which beasts I'm going to use, usually by the time frame I need to be done and the condition of the car. They'll all get the job done. But my normal detailing style is I want to get everything done as fast as I can so I can go home, put my feet up, you know, have a cold one, watch a movie. All right, <laughs> I'd rather hey, do that than work. I, I got a question that goes along right with this. Sure. Uh, we've got Steve K. Just to reiterate the, about using the right size extension cord when using these tools, especially the 3401. That is so true. And, you know, for our power strip, we are hooked into the Flex 12-watt extension cord. I am so sad to say Flex quit making these. They were the nicest, highest quality extension cord on the market. If you know anybody that has one and they don't realize what they have, offer them 20 bucks for it and, you know, and or laugh. Or just, <laughs> just like, hey, can I borrow it? But and there's, but the, you know, we sell the uh, Prolock here, and that's a 12-gauge. Yep, and 12, we only have the, amp. Yeah, but just don't, don't use a cheap extension cord to run your expensive tools. And why is that? Because it'll burn up the motor, okay? okay? So it, uh, enough electricity cannot flow through a cheap cord to adequately feed the motor and it's uh, gonna cause problems with the circuitry and the, the motor itself. Okay, so those are the beasts. And then over here we got the Rupes Mille. Now, and, go ahead. Go and ahead. you must do this because Todd Helm does that. <laughs> Mille. Yeah. You can't just say Mille, you must be Italian. It's a mille. It's a mille. Okay. Now this is five millimeter gear driven. And the 341 was what? Is eight millimeters. Okay. So it's it's three millimeters smaller, and one of the benefits to that is it makes it more precise. Um, it has a higher OPM and RPM than all the beast tools. So theoretically, on paper, it has a lot more correction ability. But if I put this. This is a Rupes, the new CP contour profile, the Rupes CP foam pads. If I turn this on and lock it, see that little tiny distance between the ghosting image and the actual perimeter of the pad spinning? Uh -huh. Very tiny. And um, what this enables you to do is to get closer to an edge or a component like this trim while maintaining really good um, contact with the working portion of the pad for doing correction work. That is a definitive benefit to uh, small um, orbit stroke gear driven tools. Um, and of course, like all Rupes tools, it's very smooth, it's very refined. Um, so in most cases, if I got a paint correction to do, in most cases for me, I'm going to grab one of these four just to get in there and knock it out because I don't get to deal with pad stalling with all the other tools. Nothing wrong with that if you're a beginner or you're not in a hurry, you're just an enthusiast, you know, you're gonna take your time to go out and buff out the Volvo in the garage on a Saturday. But most of the time for me personally, like, like, like to start a detail, wash the wheels and tires, wash the car, clay the car, tape everything off and then do the, you know, clay it and then do the paint correction and then put a coating on it. You're talking anywhere from five to 12 hours and that's without taking breaks. So using a gear driven orbital, in my opinion experience, is the fastest way to do the paint correction step because you don't have to monitor, you mentally don't have to think about is the pad rotating, is the pad rotating, is the pad rotating. By you know, looking at it all the time, you can completely remove that from the equation and just point the thing where you want to go and it's going to rotate. Like my friend said about the beast, all brawl, zero stall. You said that. No, it wasn't me. It was some uh, guy in the forum. Oh, Vo was it? Vobro. Oh, okay. A guy named Vobro. I think he's, I forget where he's from, but a Vobro. Okay. I always give dude credit where I get stuff. No, 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 I no, never it, steal people's stuff. The only reason why that is because I remember we were doing the <laughs> thing for my classic car. Sorry we did some TV yeah. commercials where we included that tagline, Flex 3401, all brawl, no stall. All right. Now, um, one question I have, or one statement, and one from the audience here. And while you're saying that, oh, I'm going to oh, go get another matching pad, and we'll take a look at the difference. All right. So. We have Alan. Do all gear-driven polishers deliver the same amount of torque, or do some have more torque than others? I think torque and power is what he's getting there. 
Um, I, I, again, and, um, I don't ever memorize specs for tools because um, none of that stuff really matters in my head when I'm pushing it over a panel. Um, what matters is the pad just rotates. Uh, but I think I we'll think, use that pad on your car. Yeah, we'll use this on your car. I think the um, I think the uh, I think the, uh, the the roof has someone can look it up has higher RPM, uh, higher RPM. And I don't know what the motors are, but I think that would equate to just more power, okay? okay? So then, now, is there a difference? These both are gear driven. What, is there a difference in the rotation on those? Yes, got a good question. The flex tools, which is the original gear driven orbitals, the pad rotates counterclockwise when you look down on it. So it's, it's rotating like this. Rupes uh, made theirs to rotate clockwise like a rotary. So it's rotating like this. And you know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys, um, that's an issue with them. Um, I, and I'll share you what my viewpoint is. It's a non-issue. Turn the tool on and buff out the car. <laughs> you know, no issue. <laughs> the thing issue is, is, is not an these issue. tools, they have what they call the walking effect. That's because they're gear driven. You, they're they're gear that. driven. This, and people position that as the negative. It's not a negative, it's just a characteristic. Okay, just like the free spinning tools can stall out and quit spinning, that's not really a negative, it's just a characteristic of the tool. It makes them very safe. A lot of people like that characteristic. These tools, when you're changing planes, so when you have planes like the modern C8 Corvettes, you have a, a part of the hood Seven goes angles in at an angle like this, <laughs> then it melts into an angle like this. So when you go from buffing out this plane to this plane, as you transition there, both these tools, different edges of the pads will be on one plane, another plane, and it'll tend to grab you and yank you around. There's no avoiding that. So what I teach people is buff in the direction of the length of the panel, don't go across planes, and that'll eliminate that problem. And? But the walking effect is, uh, the walking effect is not a negative, it's, it's just what it is. This, what you get from that is all the power. So you have to give up the, the smoothness of free spinning for the extra power of gear driven. It's a characteristic that goes with it. But can you also say that that also teaches you how to use the tool it properly? It kind of does. It's a self-teaching tool. If you feel it pull around on you, take a look at how you're holding the tool and the face of the pad of the panel, and maybe you, you need to make some correction work. But the, the thing I want to talk about, the direction of the rotation, is is my point being is I'll explain the different planes and how it, the tools will yank you around as one edge of the pool is on one edge of the pad is on one plane and as you're transitioning the other edge is on another plane it has a tendency to want to yank you or walk on you is they're both going to do that one's just going to pull you this way and the other's going to pull you that <laughs> way okay so all these guys that like to oh i'm a rupus guy i'm a flex guy it's all a bunch of bull BS. yeah i keep it clean <laughs> it's all a bunch of hooey you know it's just a, you know I, i've never got into that fanboy thing i just don't get it star wars hokey man Pokemon and Star Wars are not the same thing. Fanboys, you know. Uh, oh, Star Wars and Pepsi, Star Trek. Coke, <laughs> Ford, Chevy. You're a Mopar guy. You know, so I just never got into it. You know, get what works for you. Let the other guy alone. Right. Okay. Any more questions on gear driven? Uh, no. I mean, you could say the same no. thing about this. All brawl, no stall. <laughs> Okay, then these are some rotary polishers. So here at Auto Geek, when I first came to work here, we used to carry the Makita, and we also carried the 3M, and um, those have been kind of phased out. There's a couple of reasons tools go away. One is if they don't sell well, and they didn't, and they just get dusty on the shelf, and there's not a lot of profit in tools. There's not a lot of profit in any tools. There's just, it's not a big profit maker. So. Um, if there's not a lot of profit on a tool and you aren't selling any, it kind of goes away. <laughs> so now we're down to DeWalt, uh, Flex, and Rupes and Grio for our rotary collection. And uh, this is a new tool by Flex since it's, well, I'll just go uh, from you left to right. This is the GR8, so R stands for rotary. It's a compact, lightweight no, GR3. rotary polisher. GR3. GR3, uh, <laughs> GR3, so Grio's rotary three inch backing yeah. plate. It also comes with a two inch and a one inch and extensions. Yeah, two extensions. And um, it's a very well designed compact rotary polisher. Um, uh, if I had a Griot's guy, he could go through all the benefits and features and the, the design features. Which we features. have a video up there. We have, yeah, much better than me. Wrong. But you know, the, the, the trigger's what's cool because some guys may want to be grabbing it up here and you can use the trigger the same way you would if you had your hand back here because of the pivot point in the center. Yeah. I know some guys may not like that, but it is a kind of a cool feature. Uh, just like their other boss tools, the variable speed dials on both sides. So if you're left-handed or right-handed, it's, it's 
quick and easy with the, your thumb to adjust the rotation. Um, port side brushes, quick and easy to replace, filtered vent screens, uh, overmold rubber, lots of uh, integrated rubber here that has uh, imprints in it to make it easy to grip. I mean, and quiet and smooth. I mean, it's everything you need in a lightweight, small, compact rotary polisher for doing what I call surgical buffing. You know, so if you want to get a, an extension with the one inch pad on there to get into the paint behind the side mirror there, you can do it. You know, and you could do it with these bigger tools too, but because they're bigger full-size tools, there's just more awkward. It's more awkward to see around the body of the tool to see what you're doing so you don't make a mistake. So definitely a use for the uh, compact, subcompact tools here. This is the Rotary from Rupes. Um, it is the only one I have. I tell you, they, they really did a good job of designing this polisher. Like all the Bigfoot tools, it's smooth, it's quiet, it's refined. It's like the Ferrari of rotary polishers. I wish I had more of them here, but I just have the one. So whenever I have a class like this last class on my boat class coming up where we use a ton of rotaries, everybody just has to kind of share this one. Um, I like always like their uh, overmold up here, which makes it easy to grip. Um, I think the, um, the RPMs, let's see if it says the RPMs are something like uh, 400 to 2200, somewhere in that know. range. So very, very low, but also more than enough power to do heavy compounding like buffing out an entire car. Uh, the Rupes rotaries. Uh, this is the original PE14 with the cord. Those are flex. Oh, I'm Rupes. sorry, flex. See, my, that's why I'm here, people. Yeah, my <laughs> mind gets uh, behind where my hands are going. So here's Rupes. Sorry, Rupes. Here's Flex. This is the original PE14. This replaced the 603, which was a full size rotary. And this is compact, lightweight, very quiet. It uses stainless steel gears that are precision machined, not stamped. That's why it's quiet. A lot of you guys didn't know that. Has a low RPM of 400 off the trigger, 600 on the trigger, all the way to 2100 RPM. The entire tool has a rubber overmold at the front. I mean, it's just a really nice tool. And this is the cordless version. And I'll just tell you, whenever I'm using rotary nowadays, I'm always grabbing the cordless. It has all the power you need. I, look, um, I could completely sand one of these down and pull every sanding mark out with cordless. I don't need to go to a corded tool. And, but what I really like to show is if you look on here, it's got this brush. And I like to show you guys how to machine scrub stuff, like machine scrub tires, machine scrub upholstery, carpets, floor mats. Um, you can just do so much with this. It's got a two Thank inch well. bristle. We sell these here at Auto Geek. You don't want the short bristle. They're just too short. They're, they don't work that good. But when you're using cordless and you're around liquids or water, like washing a car out in the driveway and you got water running, the ground's wet, you got a corded tool, you could get shocked. I've, it's happened to me before. <laughs> so cordless, there's no worry, plus all the power. And quiet, you know, you can actually turn a stereo on out here and hear yourself as you're running the tool. So two great options uh, from uh, Flex for the rotary. By the way, I'll, I'll make a comment here. You know, if I go up on the, I'll just use the general term internet. And I see people talking about uh, full-size tools like this. Okay, the DeWalt, great tool, great company. Full-size, that's a full-size. This is seven, eight pounds easy. This is five pounds. Look at the body size. This is lightweight, compact, okay? That, that is a major difference when you're going to hold a buffer up all day long, um, especially when you do boat detail. Now, boat, the biggest part of the boat is the hull. And what people don't understand about boats is the, the side of a hull is in a flat wall. It goes away from you. Okay, it's a V shape. And that means as you're buffing, you're, put, you're not pushing like this, you're pushing like this. And it taxes all <laughs> your forearm muscles, your shoulder muscles, your back muscles, your leg muscles. You're finding all the muscles that you never use. It's a very taxing <laughs> job. And I always see a lot of people say, well, you know, you need a full size rotary buffer to do that. Well, look, I've used both these on boats and here's what happens. Like this coming week, this next week when my boat class gets here, I will lay out the DeWalt's. I will lay out all the flex polishers and everybody that comes to this class, the, these go first, okay? This one will go first. The full size ones are like, oh, if someone gets to the table late, <laughs> oh man, do I gotta use that? Yeah, what you I gotta use that. This? And I'm apologizing, gee, I've got like 24 flex pol rotaries out here and I had 25 students and one guy had to grab this thing, this loud, heavy, you know, awkward, full body size. 
So I, I always see the guys on the internet going, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with full size. I have one. Yeah, it's because you only wanted to spend 200 bucks. These are like 400 bucks, but they're lightweight, compact in size, and they're a lot quieter. And I'll tell you, from what I've seen, everybody, if given the choice, they grab these before they grab traditional, conventional rotary buffers. Nothing wrong with them, but again, you're, when you're buffing out the side of anything, a car door, not only do you got to push that tool forward, you got to hold it up, okay? A hood's one thing, you just let the weight of the tool do the work, but the sides of things like boats, it's the, all these muscles right here that are guiding it, stabilizing it, and, 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 um, and holding it up while your chest muscles and your biceps are tend to pushing it forward into the side of a hull. So a uh, huge difference is that, uh, or, or that a small, compact, lightweight polisher is my choice over the loud, like my original, like my original, even this one's considered a full size polisher rotary all right with that being oh. said oh, where are you going i'm walking back over here man you're walking out of my frame gotcha um let's let uh, all right we have a couple questions now one question for me it'd be when would you use so actually let me just reword this for the rotary basically you would use that for your cutting yeah, well, you know, that's because I'm leading to the that's next. That's a one. controversial I topic. Know, cause, cause I'm leading into uh, the other question because we have Alan Arn here. Uh huh. Uh, is it possible to finish the paint swirl free with the rotor alone, or should you always use a DA after rotary? That's so, what I'm and, and I'm very careful when I type about this because people will try to take what I've typed in the written word. <laughs> use it and against you? <laughs> yeah, well, use it against me, but post all over the place out of context. So, Here's here's the deal, and I'm not going to name names here, but there are some people also that detail cars in this industry are instructors and are really knowledgeable, and we're all of the same opinion that anytime you're using a rotary polisher, it doesn't matter how soft the pad is or what the abrasive technology, it is imparting a scratch pattern that your eyes cannot see, but it's still there. So I do not believe the best way to finish out a car is with the rotary. I think you're always better off to switch to orbital to consistently leave a swirl-free, hologram-free finish that'll endure over time. Okay, so you can, I've seen guys, uh, this is usually what happens. A guy will take a rotary and polish out a white colored car and go, look, I am the god of the rotary buffer. You know, there's no holograms, there's none that you see. Okay, you give, you do that to a black car, there's still maybe none that you see. You give that car back to the owner and they just start doing nothing but washing it. Now all the oils, the, the fillers, the waxes, the sealants, the coatings, all this stuff starts to wear out and you pull it out at noon in direct sunlight and look at it and you will see the telltale sign of holograms. So for all you guys that, that want to be the god of the rotary buffer and finish out with nothing rotary, it's going to look great, but it is, it currently it is my opinion that there's no combination of pad technique, tool, or product that'll leave a guaranteed 100% hologram, hologram free finish on any kind of paint. And I, wouldn't you know, it be more efficient? I think it'll look good, but I just, I believe if you had the right way to view it, you know, one of the, some of these powerful scopes, yeah. if you had the right way to view it, so chemically strip it, right way to view it, you're gonna see the telltale signs of a hologram. And wouldn't it be more efficient anyways to be using a DA after a rotary? Because well, you know, that's personal preference. Because, because look, it's kind of fun. Here, when I teach my rotary class, everybody loves to grab the cordless, and I put, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So the easiest way to learn how to use rotor, here's a little tech tip for you. <laughs> Did you get that one on there? <laughs> I'll have to use the lock mechanism. Are you sure? Come on, He-Man. <sighs> That's an experimental uh, backing plate. It was given to me. So when I teach my rotary class, whoops, I wanted that backing plate. I was going to say, he just took it off for nothing? Well, I, I wanted it, so I'll show you what I do. It's even too it's even too big, but what I do is I put small foam pads on there. I need a a, a four inch backing plate, but here's here's a real easy pad to learn how to use. This is a five inch Lake Country Force Hybrid pad, and you put that on this polisher, and because it's small and thick, and that helps with the rotary. It's really easy to learn how to guide it and move it, and it's very safe. So. Um, I can see how some people may want to compound first with a wool pad and, and do the correction work and then come back with a nice small soft pad like the CarPro gloss pads are really, really soft and leave just an incredible looking finish, you know. 
and uh, then seal it up. I mean, I, I got I got nothing against anybody that wants to do that. It just ain't gonna be me. Gotcha. So, and I, and I've turned out some work here that's rotary only in my life. There's full everything I do is fully documented. I could pull it up right now. It's, you look at it. It's, I pull it out in the sun. You look at it. There are no holograms. But I'm just telling you, over time, they're gonna come out. Anytime you've got something spinning in a circle, I need a four-inch pad. That's what I need. Four-inch pad or four-inch backing plate. plate. Uh, uh, here, I'll get you one. Yeah, there's probably going to be one right over there on the steamer cart. I probably got 30 of these things out here for the class because I got 25 polishers I set up. Yeah, that's that's a four inch. Yeah, then I was looking okay. at the other one. The other one looks like. Yeah. yeah, so if you're watching this, you want to learn how to use a rotary, get yourself a little four inch backing plate. This is Lake Country. We sell them here at Auto Geek. And then they get you like a five inch pad. And thicker is usually better for rotary, especially when you're learning. And there's just nothing easier than using this to polish paint. It works great. Okay. You can go over curves, flat panels. It's a nice way to learn how to use the rotary. Yeah, it's kind of a controversial subject and I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers so you guys can all make up your own mind what you think is really happening down at the surface level. But I'm telling you, I've seen things <laughs> with uh, powerful scopes on paint surfaces. And uh, to me, it, this is kind of ridiculous, but outside of blowing, over the paint, anything more aggressive than that is leaving a mark, you just, your eyes can't see it. Other tools can, but your eyes can't see it. Especially if you start doing things like putting waxes or sealants or even coatings on, you're gonna fill all that stuff in, it's gonna look visually perfect. All right, so with that being said, we went through all of them, so now it is viewer questions. Yes, <laughs> I'm gonna go back through all the questions that you guys have been posting. If you have any more, post them in the comments. I ask Mike answers and you guys learn. So let's go here. Let's bring up a split screen of us. All right, you gonna stay right there, Mike? Yeah, I'll stay right here. All right, cool. All right, we have. Uh, I was looking for a pad up here without a hole. Everything has a hole. Oh well, well there you go. Well, it means I can't put a big pad on this. Well, no, yeah, can. you can't. All right, so we have the Waxman Detailing Studio. What do you think of the Udo? <laughs> Uh, the Udos. You know, I get asked that question a lot, and um, I know there's been a lot of engineering that went into it. Um, I think in this, here's how I answer that question. In the same way we started out with the original Bigfoot, and it's now called the Legacy, in case you don't know. Then we went to the Rupes Mark II, and now we're at the Mark III. Mark that tool went through an evolution and each time it got better and better. So I think, I think the Udos is an amazing piece of technology and it has a bright future in front of it. All right. Uh, let's go right here. Michael O'Neill. Can Mike talk about the Buff Bright LED lights for polishers? Have you ever used those? I, I, um, I have. I actually got one in my office that I've dedicated to bolt on one of these to write a review and I just freaking never got to it. Um, one time I made a video with the owner of that company live at SEMA, and it was the first time I'd used it. I mean, I'm familiar with the concept, but the first time I actually used it, and I think I was using it on a 1958 Volkswagen or something in, in our booth or a Ferrari in our booth, and one of the things I said, well, this is really interesting. I can see defect removal in real time, just yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I can see the defect removal in real time. Not like buffing, wiping, grab a swirl finder light, but as I'm buffing, I could actually position that light and see defect removal in real time. But, but here's what I do. Um, and, and this is my argument against painted walls a certain color or certain lights in the garage. If you do a test spot, Okay, and I, you know, I like to share this. I'm the guy that actually coined that term. I'm glad to see the whole industry use it. But if you do a test spot, so the test spot is where you, you, t you take a car like this or whatever it is you're gonna work on, and you test the pad, the product, the tool, and your technique as part of it on one small area, and you dial in a process, you know, a combination of those things that gets the swirls out with a certain amount of known section passes. So I use eight as a general reference number, but it could be 12, it could be four, who knows. But so you make section passes like this, like this, and you do this eight times, you wipe off, and all the defects are gone to your satisfaction. Chances are if you do that to the rest of the paint on the car, you're gonna get the same results. At that point, the walls could be pink with black polka dots. I could have any kind of light, or you could blindfold me no light at all. If I do the same thing that worked in the test spot, I'm gonna get the same results over the rest of the car. All right, everybody out there, hashtag blindfold. And if we have enough 
If we get 50 <laughs> people saying I'd hashtag blindfold, we will I will have Mike it's, it's blindfolded all, every, and do it in car. The end results of your car is always dialed in and proven in the test spot. Once you dial that test spot in, the only other factor that could take place that may alter your results is say you got different paint on the car, got an accident, you didn't know about it, you dialed yep. in the test spot to the hood, but the rear fender was painted at Mako and the paint's harder, and all of a sudden the thing that you're using isn't quite working. But that is such a... Uh, that is such a hypothetical. Oh, little. It's just, it's there, and chances are, if you're using good stuff, it's going to work anyway. I mean, what are the odds are the fenders repainting the paint is harder and doesn't really work well to the great stuff you're using on the rest of the car? I mean, it's such a extreme way out there, never going to happen kind of thing. I forgot but, what but the yeah, question was. <laughs> I did too, but you dial in your test spot, and um, that's where all the magic is. You dial in that oh, test the buff spot. Bright, buff yeah, the, so the buff bright. So I don't use the buff bright because, because. I dial in my test spot so I don't need any more light. I'm just going to repeat that same thing. And if I'm working a long thin panel, I, let me just push this aside. Here, throw, this throw, is, throw that over and this, this is way. this is important. Okay. Can you put it, uh, hold on. Let I me, can do anything you want. Throw it in front of the table. In front of the what table? Okay. Yeah, because if not um, where you're going, I'm going to not be able to see. Okay. So when doing a, a section pass, you know, when you and me are out here shooting videos, I'm always referencing making a crosshatch pattern. But years ago, way before anybody made anything on YouTube, I wrote this article called, Let the Panel Be Your Guide. And sometimes I got stupid names for my articles, but what that meant was when I'm looking at a long, thin panel like this, it'd be stupid to make a crosshatch pattern. So now I'm just going to run the polisher back and forth in the direction of the length of the panel. And when I do a test spot on that, or if I'm buffing that out, I don't do like eight, I'll do 10 to 12. So one, two, and if you get up to 12, chances are if you dialed in a test spot using a crosshatch on a big flat area, you're gonna get the same kind of defect removal on the long thin panels just moving in a linear action. Okay. Make sense? Makes sense. Okay. All right. That's really deep stuff for some people. Yeah, we are going, oh, my, this channel. Is Let like, the panel be your guide. It actually has a picture of Yoda in the article. In the article, that's it says, not plagiarism. In your best Yoda voice, say, "Let the panel be your guide." Mm, panel be your guide. <laughs> exactly like that. Something like that. <laughs> that I can't was, do it, so I never embarrass myself yeah, trying. Well, I try. Uh, well, now you well, asked no. me earlier, why do I put tape around the speed dial on the CD? Oh, I did. Let's, yeah. All right. Let's Can go you see here. that? Okay, I'm there. So why? Because. It's cordless, has a lot of power, but I find myself when I'm using this tool, working around a car, I bump the speed dial. And sometimes I don't notice it, and I don't want to be at speed five or four, I want to be at speed six, so all my CBs, I just go ahead and use some 3 and vinyl tape and I tape it in the six position. And also when I hold it after I set the speed, I grab it back here. It's a lot more balanced to buff with than holding it here. And if you're new to machine polishing, learn how to use the speed lock tool. Um, in my classes, I walk around and I tell people this, but people can't remember everything they learn in one day. But I see people buffing and they're holding the trigger. You know, don't do that. Lock it into place and then start buffing. Okay, now moving along, sorry. Learn to use your tools. I think I need to get a new soundboard. Uh, let's go, Alan. Won't going up on edge sling product all over. I'm not here to make the car pretty when I'm doing correction work. I'm here to get the defects out of the paint. If it slings product, that's what it does. You know, the answer to that is spend 400 bucks on this tool. You're still going to sling product because in rotary mode, that's what it does. To me, that's just a non-issue. You know, it's like a lot of people never like the Rupes blue pads because they spit product out. I didn't care. I'm going to wipe the panel anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so some things that really bug people just don't bug me. Vibration on tools, it never bugs me. I've never been the guy that goes out and goes, I need those gloves that that's reduce that. the vibration. Uh, here, here, Mel Craig comes on. What's your take on anti-vibration gloves when using vibrating tools <laughs> for, over many years? For me, I just, it doesn't matter. You know, what, but, what is that? But if some Hashtag guys are just rubbing your raw, your nerves raw, by all means, get some. All right. So uh, I, I think I'm just tougher than some guys. Uh, get calluses. Be, maybe not. Uh, I have, I, I've, got, I've got no calluses right now, but I'm not, I'm not unfamiliar to them. All right, let's go to Romero. Uh, so how many pads we need to buff a car properly? I think that came in a little bit what, after when we were talking when about When using it. foam pads, doing correction work, one pad per panel is a good number to shoot for. So uh, if you think about it, a two-door car has nine panels. A four-door car has 11 panels. So say you just had six pads. That's better than the guy trying to do it with two. So I always say, let your budget be your guide. Yep. So, 
Okay. But more pads is better. And I never know, uh, technically, gram grammatically, is it more pads are better or more pads is better? Is it is or are? More better. More are better. More are better. More pads are gooder. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> more, more are pads are gooder. You know, when we do these live things, I like to be serious and try to impart knowledge that'll help people, but I like to have some fun too. Yeah, we, it's, yeah it's, education can be boring. All right, let's go here. Brian Stevens. Hi, Mike and Nancy. Greetings from your Corvette guy in Sal Cal. Peace out to you. Can we get a discount on the tool for taking the class today? Need a PXE to add to my arsenal. <laughs> There's no, you know, I think AutoGeek does a sell on tools twice a year. Twice and, a year. And first of all, there's what they call MSRP, Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price. We're not allowed price. to go. You, you, tool companies set their prices, and, and if you sell it cheaper, they'll not, they'll, they'll take away your ability no, uh, yeah, to sell yeah. that tool. Yeah. They'll strip you of that. So that's why you see uniform pricing all over the internet. And the people that are offering some of these cool tools at a cheaper price, they don't last long. No, they don't. There's no profit in tools. You know, say, say you make $30 on a tool, but by the time you paid the light, the guy that drives the forklift to unload the truck and put that pallet somewhere, somewhere else to take them off the pallet, put them wherever they go, and then go into a box and ship, shipped out. I mean, there's just really no profit in it. So that's why you rarely see sales on tools. So that's why it's a good idea to do like all you guys do. Do your due diligence and research. If you get a chance to do hands-on so you can find out if you actually like it, because see, once you buy it and take it out of the box, it's, it's yours. yours. <laughs> yeah. You bought and it. I, I got to tell you, that's why a lot of people take my, my three-day and my two-day detailing classes, because you get to play with all the tools. I'll give you my opinions on them, you, but you get to play on full-size cars, not demo hoods, and lots of them. You know, the September <laughs> class was a record breaker. My class did 17 cars in three days, including wet sanding two cool cars. This last class, we did 14 cars. Six cars on Friday, six cars on Saturday, and two cars for the wet setting process, and then we brought in one of the other cars and went over steam cleaning and hot water extractors and interior detailing. So we, we you know, technically you could say we did 15 cars in two days because we used the car twice. But they're also huge freaking cars too. Okay, uh, let's go here. Do you know how much the, I think he was talking about when this came up, I'm pretty sure it was a PXE. Do you know how much that tool is? It's like 400 bucks, 400. and we can't keep them in stock. Uh, so if you want, buy one when you see it in stock. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's go to maximum. Uh, when you use the foam pad like Blue Rupes or Lake Country RNA car versus a microfiber pad. When do you do it? Yeah. Oh, uh, when you want to cut. When you, you know, I call it cutting, but compounding or paint correction. When you have serious defects that you want to visually make disappear. And the way you do that is by removing paint and leveling the surface, the top of the surface with the lowest depth of the defects you're trying to remove. Okay. Then let's go to Sarah, and no, no question <laughs> is a dumb question. Uh, sorry if this is a dumb question, but <laughs> would a poor cable be able for applying wax or possibly a one-step polish and beast or super beast for paint correction work? Sorry if it was already asked. No, I'm work watching you could use either tool for both. I got to tell you, the porter cable... Um, I, I should do the research to find out when it was introduced as a wood sander. Don't you have an um, article on that? I, I, I don't. I do have an article oh, called... You heard it here first. He doesn't have an article on that. I have an article that. on the origin, I, on the date, but I have an article on the origin. It's called The Free Spinning Spindle Bearing. I'm the story behind the sp story. Add, but you just type in the free spinning spindle bearing and add Mike Phillips, and that article will pull up either on McGuire's online or Autogeek online. Okay. <laughs> but it talks it. about how it's a wood sander. But no, they're both very capable tools. The biggest thing with the Porter Cable is when you buy one of these things. Oh, you're out of frame. It, I'm coming back All over. Right. The biggest thing with this tool right here is when you buy one of these things, it comes with a foam pad that's glued. It's a one time use backing plate, and it's really thick and it's useless. I actually have an article on that, the foam pad that comes with the port cable. Of time. Type that into Google and you'll pull my name. I got almost 800 All articles right, the now. Now, hold on. So the deal is, is what I tell people is throw that thing away, buy yourself a five inch backing plate, and then start investing in thin pads, microfiber or foam, because they're going to rotate the best. And then it's a very capable tool. All right, I have your one up, the free spinning one. And the beast, it's gear driven. It's capable no matter what you want to do. Ellet. Elliot, I'm on live. Dang it. <laughs> um, what did you want on this article that you had me pull up? Oh, I just, you know, if you scroll down, you'll see where it's used as a wood sander. It has a vacuum oh, attachment okay. to on, it. Hold on, hold on. I'm bringing it in. But, but you'll see my finger poking the free spindle, free 
Yeah, my mind that right there. Right yeah, there. so so someone one time asked, what's the exact name of this thing? Because someone tried to call it a clutch and things like that. It's called the Free Rotating Spindle Bearing Assembly. That is the official terminology from Porter Cable. And there's it being used for what it really was meant for. And that's me sanding that wood desk down there, and that belonged to uh, Malcolm McGuire. Malcolm. Yeah, he was the second chemist for McGuire's. He was the son so of So was Frank. he Malcolm in the middle? He, he was. <laughs> it was Frank McGuire Jr., there was Malcolm, and then there was Barry. All right. And I got his old desk and sanded it down and refinished it. Okay, so no dumb questions here. They're all good questions. Uh, we did that one. We did that one. Oh, this is a good one. Alan again. Is there a preference in these polishers when using clay discs? I don't know. I, you know, I, when, I, when I wrote the Flex book, I was a big fan of using uh, the Nanoskin clay disc on the Flex Beast, and it does do a good job. But I've went through an evolution in how I think about mechanical decontamination. And um, I think there's two different approaches. And most of the time, I'm in the school of using an ultra-fine clay. Um, the reason why is because sometimes, here's an example. Um, sometimes you don't know if the paint is hard or soft until you do a test spot. Now, follow me. You don't do the test spot until you have done claying. So if you take a rubberized tool, towel, mitt or pad and decontaminate a car and find out the paint's really hard but the decontamination process put scouring or scratches in it's like whoops <laughs> now i gotta get that stuff out uh -oh. now if you haven't done the test spot because you don't do that before the clay step usually and you use an ultra fine clay then you just avoid all that problem but see the last thing you want to do is soft or hard paint is scour or scratch the paint through the mechanical decontamination process so if i'm doing a production detail and the car is really contaminated and i'm washing the car outside i will usually use a, a nanoskin towel or something like that but once the car's in here and it's washed and dried onto ultra soft or ultra fine grade clay. And the difference between using an ultra fine grade clay and any other tool or type of clay is the number of passes you do. An aggressive clay may remove the overspray paint in eight passes. The ultra fine will still do it, but it may take 20. So I will trade off a little bit of time for safety versus speed over instilling or inflicting swirls yeah, and scratches into the, the paint. The first thing is to do no harm. Try to do the least amount of harm. That part. is an article I wrote called The Detailer's Oath. It's the Hippocratic, the Detailer's Hippocratic Oath. And I need to get you to take a picture of me with the hand on my detailing book, take on the oath. Because I want to do something with that article. All right, we can do that. Uh, let's go here. How is my I should mic? probably wear a suit and tie for that. You should. Sorry, or, guys, if my audio keeps Dr. going in and out. Smock. Actually, hold on, I'm going to. Hello. No, that I have a channel going out on my soundboard, it sounded like. So I think you can find that if you type in the detailer's Hippocratic Oath, you pull that article up. I will come back to that. I'm just leaving somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and it's 4.30ish. Yes, so. and it is 4.30. I'm trying to get through some of these. Some people say make your videos shorter, but if, hey, we're having well, fun well, and Well, this is, a, uh, this is a lot of knowledge to drop on this. I there's mean, a lot of there, tools there, to cover. There's a lot of tools, so there's a lot of things. So let's go to Sal Cal. Uber dude! Uh, which should I get, the Rupes 21 ES or the Rupes 75 120 random orbital polisher? Um, um, if it was me, he must have a large pneumat or air compressor to run the. Uh, if it was me, if you already have other polishers, I'd go for the 75. If you already got other things. Okay. And you got a big air compressor. That's the pneumatic. I think I got it over there. Okay. No, you're fine. Um, now, here's a good question. I never, I don't think I've ever seen this asked before, and it comes from our friend Kirby. Kirby. Is an 8 millimeter DA good to spread a spray wax? You bet. I've, ne you know, that's one thing I've never thought about. It's like, no, you bet. One time, a long time ago, I tried um, a machine applying all kinds of wacky things like class or wacky, uh, wacky things. Like class SG, like uh, Colony 845, and the one from Optimum, I forget what it was. It's Optic uh, oh, uh, um, just car wax. They're yeah. clear car yeah. wax. And just some things, anything that's like a lotion is usually going to work better to machine apply versus a spray. And one of the benefits anything is spray on is usually, supposedly one of the benefits is quick, fast, and easy. Mist it on, spread it around, wipe it off. Mm -hmm. So, but hey, Kirby. Kirby's been to three of my classes, if I remember correctly. The road show in Tacoma, the road show in Texas, and a three-day here. Mm -hmm. So, Come on, Kirby, you know all this stuff. Well, he's putting it out there, so we ask it so other people learn. That's all good, and we appreciate that, we Kirby. Appreciate Keep that. putting those questions in there. Kirby has a, a great name for his detailing business. My guy detailing. My guy detailing. 
So. Yeah, I got a guy. I got a guy. Uh, let's go here. Chris Main. Thoughts on Adams Polish's new SK Pro? I haven't been in. We there. don't sell them, so I don't show them. I mean, it doesn't make sense for me to show things you can't buy from yeah. AutoGeek. Um, I've never used it. I've read nothing but good things about it. I know I've known Adam for uh, 2003. Been a while. 20 some years. He's a great guy. Whatever he says, it's gold. And take his advice. Do what he says. Your car will look great. All right. What about a Max <laughs> Max Shine M21 DA? Have you ever? I heard? I've never used them. I've seen them out of places. I've seen them at SEMA, but I've never. Yeah. Heard. You know, pe pe you know, um, look, people can. Uh, a long time ago, one of the guys we work with who's been here longer than both of us. He once said, "Mike, don't ever spend another man's money." Yep. So you know, um, if you want to buy Max Shine tools, we don't sell them here. So uh, go for it. All right. Now this is a good question. We have Steve K. What's the time frame for Flex to discontinue the corded 34? Within the next two years of the United States, and I think they're already starting to stop selling in other countries. I think, uh, I think Chris said that when he was down yep, here. He said that he, uh, I had um, nine vendors in my last class. Chris Metcalf was one of them, and someone asked that question. Me and Yancey both heard it. They're already starting to discontinue. And you can tell the original by the aluminum head. Right. Now, these other two still have the aluminum head. They're just encased by the plastic shroud. It's basically the same tool. Yep. Very minuscule, very, little difference. The very difference in, internally, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah, very different. But yeah, uh, for the people that want the extra power, OPM, RPM, extra OPM, RPM, uh, get one now. And I'll tell you a little secret. I've been here for going on almost 11 years. And um, I think I can count three times people have sold their beast. And two times they regretted it. Doesn't mean the other person didn't regret it. I just never saw a follow up. But they came up and said, Yeah, I sold that and I bought this. And they come back out, damn, I should have never <laughs> sold it. Has anybody got a used one for sale cheap? And the answer is no. So they got to pay full price a second time. Right. You never piece. see them up on you the board. You never see them for sale. If yeah. you do, buy one, put it on eBay for like 100 bucks more, and it'll disappear. All right. I'd also say if you're going to get the beast, remember we talked about this earlier, backing plates are wear items, mm -hmm. they wear out. And um, Chris told me that the manufacturer for this backing plate in Germany was having a hard time source all the raw materials because of the COVID. So that's why there's always been a back order on them. I think we got some now. But if you're going to buy a couple of these or just one of these, stock up on some of these so you have well, one into the future. Didn't Lake Country make a, a they well, made that was a, a smaller one. They made a, 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 a four inch. Yeah, they made a four inch conversion right. kit. And I don't know if they still do or not. Yeah. But um, to tell you the truth, um, Another way of answering that question, should I get the conversion kit? It is in my flex book. Is a lot of times people ask me, hey, Mike, which polisher should I get? That's a great question. I say, can I change that? Let's word it this way. Which polisher should I get first? first. Okay. <laughs> if you're going to get a beast, get a beast. Come on, we're guys. On, we like more tools. Later on, add a Pixie or a Nano or GR9 or GR8, you know. Right. But yeah, you, you need more. You can get by with one tool, but it's nice to have a selection. Yep. Well, some tools work better I'm for I'm a big fan of uh, having a rotary, having a beast, and having a, um, a, a micro tool, and also having like a, a simple yeah. polisher. Uh, sometimes, here's something I've learned over the years, is really soft paint. It's, it's easier to finish out on soft paint using a free-spinning random orbital polisher than a gear-driven or orbital polisher. Um, and it's easier to tackle something like a Porsche with the short stroke versus a long stroke if you're just going to use one tool. So that's why I'm a big fan of things like the Porter Cable or the G9. Okay. Short stroke, free spinning, random, tackle any soft paint job there is out there. Okay, uh, let's try to get a few more in here. Uh, this is Jan, Han, Jan, am I saying your name right? Uh, he's from Slovakia. He's been in our nurse. He's saying, hello, you're absolutely right with the test spot and light, Mike. What is your personal feeling about two model Makita PO 5000 6000 or slash 6000? This is also a specific machine. Um, well, first of all, good question. First of all, Makita came here and I organized a huge class with some really cool cars in horrible shape to do all their beta testing for that tool. One of the things I said to them is, hey, when you're done, I'd like to have a prototype back or an early model, a first edition. And they never, they'd laugh. They didn't think I was serious. And I always was kind of offended by that. Um, I have a nice collection of um, low serial number and beta tools. When it did come out, um, 
it's, it's useless in the free spin mode. It won't maintain pad rotation. So the only thing you can use it for is the gear drive mode, which is five millimeter. And um, I'm actually not a big fan of the five millimeter gear dri driven style. That's why you always see me using the beast. If you like it, go for it. But um, I tend to like the eight millimeter. I find it faster. I find it more aggressive. And uh, that's what I like about it. I want to get the job done as fast as I can. And so that's what I use. But you know, the, it's a, Makita makes great tools, you know. Um, and the, what works best on that, I think, is usually like a five and a half inch pad. So I don't know, that's a good tool. We got six of them here. Yep. Usually there's a couple of them hanging up around here, but we brought in one pallet to sell them. It took forever to sell them, and when they finally went away, because you don't make a lot of money on tools, because it just gathered dust, we never reordered. Mm -hmm. So if that kind of tells you where the market's at with those tools, we quit selling them because they just didn't sell well. All right, let's go, since we're on gear driven right now, let's go to Detailing Law UK. Uh, does the gear-driven polishers also co uh, cause, I want to say that's what it is, cause micro holograms when used to finish like a rotary? Uh, uh, um, well, less likely. Less likely. Uh, you know, it really just depends on the pattern of the product because okay. you're orbital. But I actually just talked about that. I said a free spinning tool is going to finish out nicer on soft paint than a gear-driven tool. So the opposite of that is, is a gear-driven tool will tend to micromar soft paint. When you get to the medium and the harder paints, it's a non-issue. Okay. I finish cars all the time time with the beasts all the time yes he does people no problem all right let's go here let's go to p fusion technologies hi guys this is abdul from p fusion technologies for a newbie what's the best cordless polisher and cutting compound combination for cars with black paint i think people get hung up on these colors of paint too much um versus cars with silver or white paint yeah. Well, if you're working on a clear coat, it doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Because you're not working on the color paint, you're working on a clear layer. It's just that darker colors will show things like micromari. So what I tell people, and this is a good question, the first thing you need to do is be using great abrasive technology. You know, I type about this, I talk about this, and I teach it in my class. What touches your paint first? Yeah, it's what touches your paint first. And there's there's two categories of abrasive technology in the market, and I don't want to cuss, but I'm going to. There's great abrasive technology, or and there's, there's crap. Okay. Ah, yeah. There is no in-between. There's no compound, polish, or AIO that works kind of good. It either works great or it doesn't. Or it doesn't. Okay? So that's the first thing. And if, if, you're, use, if you're using somebody's product on a black car and you're seeing micromarring, which means you're turning the car gray because you're, you're obrading something that's clear. When you abrade something that's clear, you turn it white or opaque. And the same thing happens on a white car. as a black car. You just, your eyes can't see it. But if the products you're using are micromarring, the chances are they're not using good abrasive technology. So I always tell people, don't skimp. Always get you know, established brands, things with good reputations. And, um, but as far as like, which which of the cordless tools to go? He probably missed this, but I talked about all the other cordless car polishers on the market today. I have them in my office. I've used them, and I've seen a whole bunch of guys say it's all the same. They're all batteries, but they're wrong. The Flex batteries last the longest on a running when you're using them, and they recharge the fastest when you charge them. All the other battery technologies falls short. And that means you're going to need more batteries to buff out the same car, and it's going to take a lot longer to charge them, so you better stock up. Mm -hmm. You know, until they catch up with Flex, Flex is the king of the battery-operated tools at this point in time. Okay, now let's speed round. All right, okay. speed round. Uh, Alex Castro, microfiber pads versus Euro 5050 pads. Uh, to me, it doesn't really matter. You know, as soon as you're using fibers, fibers or abrasives, they're going to cut better, but you're going to have a micromarring or a hologram issue. It depends on what kind of tool you're using. Okay. But yeah, use them. Just expect to come back and do a second step with foam on an orbital. Okay. Uh, let's go. Ian Jack, clean your machine. <laughs> Dude, you're late. You need, need a shorter name. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. Where have you been? Clean machine. That means your dinner's on you. Uh, no, he was just saying that he's late. Uh, Renardo, got some news for you. The man. The Man Up t-shirts are coming. Got the green light to do some uh, merchandise. So oh my gosh. Pay attention to the channel. <laughs> we are going to have some merchandise that's going to be only available first on YouTube. And uh, so if you guys are interested in some swag by this, we're going to have it I haven't seen up this yet. Yeah, I know, because I just got it. Well, you were in the meeting. I got the green light for that. So. Gotcha. Good stuff coming Are your way. Are we doing people. the swirl and the squirrel shirt? I do have that already designed up. Cool. Re save a squirrel, remove a uh, Save a squirrel, remove a squirrel. Uh, <laughs> save a squirrel, remove a squirrel. <laughs> That's a tongue tie here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, uh, last actual. 
oh, here we have Kirby again. Flex battery charger are so smart. They show me the time to complete the charge. Yes, they do. And the only battery, only battery technology that does that. It, right. it, it, when you put a battery into it, it reads it. It tells you how long it's going to take to recharge it. But the batteries talk to the charger and they talk to the tool. They're a it's smart battery technology. You know what? I, I know what everybody wants. Everybody wants to buy the cheap cordless versions of the Flex. You're going to be sorely disappointed. You get what you pay for, people. Unless you buy a boatload of batteries to keep it going. Okay, now the last real question. Yep, we already answered that one. Uh, we have Chris and just joined. Hi, Mike. Hello, how are you? Uh, you can catch us in the replay. We're about done here. We have James. Is it acceptable to apply wax with a 15 millimeter polisher? You bet. You bet. Knock it out of the bar. An AIO or a finishing wax, you know. And, and we do have people and, posting blindfold. And so. if it was me, I'd grab the cordless because then, I mean, you, you, could, you could basically throw the wax on the machine and walk around, you know, no, no cord. You could basically do it as fast as you could walk around the car. I bet you could. I am confident I got more articles on machine applying things Coming down to this side of the than table. anybody else. All right. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. And if I don't have to use my hand, I always use machine. Trust me, he doesn't. He finds but, the shortest but, way to get things machine done. Machine always beats human. Just watch the Terminator. <laughs> well, he ends up dying at the end. Well, so that's I, no, not a good back. analogy. That is not a good analogy. Hold on, scoot this way because you're going to be off oh, right okay. here in a moment. Gotcha. Uh, all right, so with that being said, we thank each and every one of you, and uh, if you guys can get that hashtag blindfold going, I will make it where he will do a, a demonstration of a test spot where he can see, then we'll go right next to it with him blindfolded oh, yeah. and get the same result. So hashtag blindfold, and if I get 50 of those, it's happening. Okay, on your car. Um, <laughs> no. Well, that's great because my car isn't here yet. Okay. I have nine, well, now with the semiconductor. Yeah, thing we'll do it on a black car so people can easily oh, can see the whatever. results. But, oh, a hood, yeah. Um, actually, a hood would be better because then we can actually get hold it up. Gotcha. Uh, so with that being said, thank you all for tuning in. Loved your guys' questions. Thanks for interacting with us. That is what this is all about. The more you guys ask, the more we get information out of him because he's not going to last forever so we need to store that away <laughs> somewhere so that's what we're trying to do with all these videos that's right or at least that's my master plan and like i said before if you haven't liked you haven't subscribed or hit the bell please do so share us with your friends and remember we're here every thursday at what time 3 p.m eastern time and what are we doing next week we're gonna have a boat in here we're gonna my boat class is next weekend, so I'm going to have two big-ass boats in here in really bad shape. So maybe we can do something boat-related. If not, it's okay. I boat, don't care. metal, because there's always metal. Boat, metal, metal Isenglass, mold removal. We'll do something. We'll, we, I, Aluminum polishing. Yeah, I don't know what is going to happen or for next week because we don't. I haven't seen yeah. the boat, so I don't know what is going to be viable. And, yeah. But we'll, we'll work something in. So. Yeah. But like that being said, I am out of here. You're out of here. And... Andre's going to come in and do some testing because we went way over. Next three-day class is in uh, first week in May, last day of April. So it's April 30th or 31st, then May 1st and 2nd. Which there the, are some spots left. The, oh, it's quick. almost full, but the most hands-on classes on planet Earth. And you get to use Every, all these tools all that we just stuff, discussed yeah. today. Yep. Okay, and thanks for watching. Else? Anything else? Anything yeah, else? Anything else? It. You sure? That's it. Are you positive? Why are you putting tools on some of the guys hood of his car? You did that. That wasn't me. That was all you. Well. Yep, that was you. But